but ultimately I, I argue that if you look around and you look at the the people driving the discourse of climate political advocacy, it's all people in what you could loosely call the PMC or the professional class. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between so between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Matt Huber is a professor of geography at Syracuse University. His new book, Climate Change as Class War, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet, is out now from Verso Books. Uh, that will be what we discuss on today's episode of Diet Soap. We're recording this on April 26th. Uh, that's 2022. And Matt, welcome to the podcast and the show. Thank you so much. I'm a fan of the show, so it's great to oh, be on. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. That uh, that warms my heart. So um, <laughs> as somebody who lives in the Pacific Northwest uh, in the United States, I was particularly struck by one particular point you raised in your book, and I want to start by that with, with that point, which was that namely when it comes to fighting climate change or uh, climate, the cli climate crisis, what we believe may not be that important. That is like to fight against the climate crisis. We don't necessarily need to fight against climate change denialists yeah. or try to convince everybody. Yeah. Uh, that's something a red herring. Yeah. Um, why why is that the case? Why why isn't it important to get your uncle to believe in the climate <laughs> change? Um I think it's just sort of a classic kind of Marxist position that it's 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 more it's more about power over economic resources and we actually have to build a significant power to overcome the existing power of uh really um extremely wealthy corporations that currently control our energy system, um, mm -hmm. whether it be electric utilities or oil and gas industry or coal companies or whatever. And, and, you know, obviously it will, it will help if people believe the science, but that's not necessarily going to be uh, sufficient or effective at building a mass movement and a massive base of power to take on those, those interests. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, we should probably stop sort of assuming that that's all it will take, just sort of convincing the many Americans who still deny the science or whatever, for whatever reason, that even if we convinced everyone, that still wouldn't be enough to overcome the power of these uh, these capitalists that control the energy system. Yeah, another thing that you point out in your book is that the class of people who tend to be most involved in activism around climate change tend to think in ways that would maybe lead to believing that what we need to do is change enough opinions. And, and, and I think maybe the reason why is because they believe that if you can change enough opinions and you can get sensible technocrats <laughs> into office and they can implement policies which will cope with the climate crisis, that, that um, there's an assumption that Maybe it's not as severe as, as it seems, or more importantly than that, it, it doesn't require as much change as you and I might believe it does mm -hmm. in order to, to tackle it. So you, you could just um, – you, you change like 0.02% of the you know, American people's opinions and you, you've got the election <laughs> or um, you guilt enough uh, relatives into voting for the Democrat <laughs> – <laughs> and you can <laughs> you can change the world. Is that basically the mentality? Do you think? So it's. I argue there's sort of multifaceted approaches to climate politics, and I mm -hmm. I try to name. Um, I proposed this book in 2017 to really make it about a critique of, uh, in in part a critique of of what I was calling professional class climate politics, 
Um, and then in the interim, like this whole PMC debate exploded and everyone <laughs> was t staking out positions on the PMC and this. And, and I do draw on those debates. But but ultimately, I, I argue that if you look around and you look at the, the people driving the discourse of climate political advocacy, it's all people in what you could loosely call the PMC or the professional class. Hello, Sublation Media viewers. I'm interrupting this interview to tell you about GCAS and a seminar that's coming up with Christopher Hedges and Boris Franklin. This seminar, which will include the book Our Class Trauma and Transformation in an American Prison by Chris Hedges and the play Caged, written by the New Jersey Prison Theater Co Cooperative, will examine the transformative power of education and creative self-expression in prison. Again, that starts on, on May 2nd. It's the first session. GCAS is our only sponsor on this channel, uh, and them stepping forward to, to help us out by being a sponsor made a big difference as we came together to create Sublation Media. So I would appreciate it if you're interested in what they're doing for you to check them out. I'll put a link to GCAS in the uh, description of this video and in the show notes for the podcast. And you can uh, take a look at not just this seminar, but what they're doing overall in the coming year. But ultimately, I, I argue that if you look around and you look at the, the people driving the discourse of climate political advocacy, it's all people in what you could loosely call the PMC or the professional class with highly educated um, journalists, academics, scientists, um, uh, uh, government workers, various kinds of professional class people. And they, they tend, yes, they tend to make it about um, knowledge, belief, denial. You know, I mm -hmm. think back to the, there was a march for science in the Trump years, like, which is, could be seen as sort of a mass uprising of the professional class against the war on facts or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, but the other, the other kind of approach that I identify is what I call the policy technocrat approach, which I think is what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. And um, these folks actually became professionalized during the kind of uh, peak of neoliberal hegemony where, you know, all policy, ser all serious policy people sort of accepted that the only way we can solve things is through, solve things is through like market uh, based mechanisms, market incentives. And they kind of just accepted the very, right-wing premises that like massive expansion of public sector investment is off the table, massive, uh, uh, you know, coordination of, uh, uh, you know, clean energy rollout that's off the table. So they kind of accepted these right-wing premises and said, well, we can design really logical and elegant policies that channel market incentives like a carbon tax or a cap and trade system that would not have to challenge capital, but could just sort of slightly nudge capital in the right directions through markets and through, again, not through building power against these interests, but but just sort of uh, politely nudging markets in the direction we, we think um, it needs to go. And then the markets will take over and sort of naturally lead us to a clean energy future. And we've been thinking this is going to happen for decades now. And it's, and you know, it, you know. Right. Just in the last year, like coal is booming, <laughs> like like uh, the share prices of oil and gas uh, companies are going through the roof um, in the last year. And it's, it's just it's, it should be clear by now that like uh, market based policies are not delivering. And in fact, as you saw in France, like they can often lead to massive working class backlash. And as we saw with the Gilets Jaunes and the Yellow mm -hmm. Vest. And, and so they're the people that advocate these policies think they're so smart. <laughs> they're so, they're so efficient and cost effective. And they're all, they have all these really attractive attributes to professional class sensibilities, but what they don't have any capacity to do is be massively popular to masses of workers or working class people. And mm -hmm. they don't have capacity to build massive power or a massive movement to confront the, the, the interests we need to confront. Well, I mean, the, the thing. Let's talk about the yellow jackets or the yellow vests. I'm sorry, the yellow jackets are <laughs> bugs. The yellow vests. Um, the the uh, uh, you know when you think about that kind of technocratic solution, the increase taxes on fuel. Therefore, you do, 
decrease fuel consumption. Yeah. Um, the reason that wasn't a popular solution was because it was regressive. Yes. Um, it, 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 it penalized the people who have the least, the most, um, right. and it relied on, it was kind of flat, I think, I'm not sure, but, uh, um, no, you're right. But, um, so, uh, that obviously is not going to be popular. Yeah. Um, however, if you offset that with some sort of tax break, yeah. um, right. for people who have to, uh, transport certain kinds of goods or who, who commute um and you could you know because that basically the the fact is they can't decrease their oil cons- their gasoline consumption exactly yeah so, um then it seems to me that you might have a policy that could be at least accepted mm-hmm. um without uh uh you know a big backlash um and then the question would be will it work right um and and i wonder if if it's possible to track even during these uprisings against the uh, the uh, increase in the fuel tax, whether or not it did work, whether or not it there was a decrease in fuel consumption in France, um, do you know? I that's a very good question. I'm not sure, um, uh, but it, the question is, what does work mean in this context? Right, right. I mean, that's the other thing. Like, what, like I I read a section in your book where you you said something like. Um, I'm just sort of trying to be a little bit uh, critical here because I uh, sided with you so immediately. Yeah. Uh, that um, So you wrote that the professional class tends to marshal technocratic knowledge to propose non-confrontational smart policy fixes to climate change that brim with logic and good incentives but fail to, in terms of mass appeal or clear mm-hmm. material benefits. And I wondered, what did you mean by material benefits? Did you mean like it won't work? They, they won't actually reduce? do anything to uh stymie the the climate crisis or did you mean it didn't increase the their living standard it did it actually you know it didn't help them materially in terms of maybe wages or something like that and so my next question is do these proposals not work and if they don't work then how logical can they be um so work in this context would mean like large scale rapid decarbonization <laughs> Of right. an entire society, um, which, by the way, I think France has a lot of to teach us because they've 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 much successfully decarbonized a lot of their electricity sector. Mm-hmm. But um, but in terms of like rapidly shifting away from oil and uh, with a, a petrol in the European context, you know, uh, I don't think it 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 did it achieved that goal. Um, but you're right; like you could design this in a in a more progressive way that uh, redistributes um, the revenue. Uh, and there's a whole army of people that advocate something called a carbon fee and dividend, which would essentially um, charge a fee on carbon that would then di- be redistributed to households as a dividend so that they could see benefits from the policy. The people that advocate this uh, are trying to attract um, Republican right-wing support. So they are very... Uh, careful to call it a carbon, uh, sorry, revenue neutral fee, which means that all the money goes to households and not to government because they don't want to be seen as growing government, (laughs) which is sort of funny because anyone that studies the climate crisis realizes that really, if we really want to solve it, we're going to need some sort of like World War II level of public sector mobilization. So if your policy basically says we're not going to create more public resources, we're just going to give it all to private households, you're you're already... um, not, I don't think you're going to really address the problem. Um, yeah. but, uh, but in terms of material benefits, like the carbon fee and dividends, like, okay, you're going to pay more for, for gasoline and electricity, but you're going to see some sort of dividend. It's going to come later already. I think most people are going to be confused. <laughs> and, yeah. And I, you know, like a lot of the, the, the proposals and ideas that got tagged around the so-called green new deal were, we're really trying to be much more direct. Like we're going to actually make energy cheaper. You know, you can clean up your energy system and make it cheaper at the same time. And you could say, uh, and you look around today and people are suffering with spiking energy costs. If you, if we, if we really did have like a new deal style rollout of a public energy program, that's not just about building clean energy and decarbonize, but actually delivering cheaper energy to people, 
that would be a material benefit, like you said, like wages or like anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also, you know, a lot of proposals about massively building out more public social housing that could be green mm -hmm. housing, but also uh, public housing. And, and these types of rollouts of public goods, people wouldn't need to, your uncle wouldn't need to know the greenhouse effect <laughs> or the theory of climate change to know that that would benefit their lives, right? To have a cheaper electric bill every month. Yeah. And, and I think we gotta we gotta stop thinking that the way to climate victory is you know like convincing them about the science and trying to think about how can you actually um, wed climate policy to to real benefits that people will see and and aren't very confusing in their lives. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you a question that came up from your previous answer about France. Would if if we could get the rest of the world to be as good as France when it came to lowering carbon emissions, yeah. would we be there? Would that be adequate? Wow. I mean, that's I probably mean, a technical question that you might not know off the top of your head, but. Well, France's electric sector, last I checked, I think is 70 to 75% nuclear. And, and that means basically 70 to 75% of their electricity they're generating is, is zero carbon. <laughs> and, right. and so, so many countries are. Some countries are are even more further along. Like uh, I would uh, like Norway, um, or even a country like Sweden. Both Norway and Sweden have uh, huge amounts of hydroelectric energy, uh, electricity, which is also zero carbon. Um, but Sweden has a combo of hydro and nuclear, um, and so these like uh, a lot of countries are so far away from that level of like 75 to 80 percent of a clean electric grid that uh yeah if we could get those countries to that level it would be massive transformation mm -hmm. and we have so much work to, to to get there um but uh but that that would be um and it, i mean it, you would have to ask a climate scientist if that would be enough to actually really uh, get us to to try and to approach this kind of target or whatever of 1.5 degrees mm -hmm. by uh, 20, uh, 2050. Like uh, many people would argue we not only need to clean up electricity, but also massively electrify a lot of things that don't run on electricity, like our oh, right. cars and our furnaces and our and industri most and significantly industrial um, production processes. So if you could get electricity to 75%, and then start electrifying more things, you start to get there. But the question is, how fast are you doing it? And how quickly are you uh, slowing down emissions? And that's more of a climate scientist question. Right. I mean, I can see why you'd want some sort of massive power, mm -hmm. um, like the state, to come yeah. in and take charge of a, a project where a lot of things have to be done at scale quickly, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, we just went through COVID and we can, we, you know, yeah. it's clear that the more privatized um, it is, uh, the, you know, the less efficient it is, or at least, you know, that certain things don't get done. Um, uh, so, but on the other hand, um, even, you know, the social democratic parts of the world had real trouble Mm -hmm. with covid um and i guess yeah. i asked to i wanted to ask a question let me see if i can find it it's what's coming to mind now is um uh basically I, i'm i'm a little skeptical about uh if if capitalism is the problem mm -hmm. i'm skeptical that you know this social democratic new deal approach yeah. can actually get us to where we need to be but if on the other hand if being like france would be adequate that seems like a reasonable goal right i mean that right. seems within reach i mean uh, you know right. obviously we wouldn't all want to eat cro croissants but other than that <laughs> i wouldn't mind anyway, i wouldn't mind either but not all of us would want to do that and <laughs> but um uh so it's it, it is a question like you you have to consider the depth of the problem that we're trying to solve Absolutely. and i think um one thing that that you hear a lot, I think, from climate change activists is it's, it's sort of a hopeless message. Like, yeah. actually, it's just all is lost already. So, um, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, how do you, do you feel that that is the case at all? Or how do how are you how do you relate to the climate crisis? Is it Armageddon? Is it something manageable? Uh, it depends on the day. <laughs> okay. But uh, um I like to, I have a six-year-old daughter, so I like to try to, 
have hope that we can we can figure this out. But um, uh, it's it's a dire it's a real it's a real civilizational challenge uh, to um, anyone that I actually you know I'm a scholar of energy and history, and you look at how long it takes societies to transition from particular energy sources and. It, mm-hmm. it can take a while. <laughs> it's not something you can. How typically... fast has it ever been? I mean, did did was shifting to fossil fuels pretty quick in historical terms, or no? How, how long? Um, no. It's quite amazing. You look, particularly if you look at the United States, like as late as like the eighteen sixties. You know, most most of the energy was still being run on wood and <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, muscle power for most applications, and it really. Uh, for, for just the shift to kind of what the, we call the kind of coal and steam era, it really took decades to kind of um, apply this technology. Um, the, the other shift that really happened that I think was a little quicker, though, was the shift to electricity, which started to happen in the 1890s. And um, again, I get the, the sort of social democratic and reformist nature, but you look at like the New Deal, um, basically electrified the entire rural countryside of the United States in about 15 years. <laughs> right. In 1934, it was about 10% of the country was, uh, uh, sorry, 10% of farms had electricity. And by 1950, it was 90%. Um, so that kind of massive, large scale transition, uh, you know, it depends on what you're talking about, but typically like a whole societal shift in the main energy source takes decades, takes a long time. Um, and it's, it's hard. Right. Um, but, uh, it is, it is possible. And I think, um, you know, technically possible. And I would just to add that, um, you also hear from climate activists. I mean, I'm a socialist, uh, and Marxist and, and I totally agree with this, that like capitalism is the problem. We need system change, not climate change. But if we're being honest, like, um, it's not likely we're going to have a revolutionary overthrow of capitalism, (laughs) Um, within the next decade or within the time scale. Hey, um, I'm starting t- another YouTube channel along with this one. So it could okay. happen. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. I think, yeah. I think we're on our way. Then. <laughs> yeah. So one of my premises is that we really need to understand the historical context we're in, which is uh, of, of just neoliberal, you know, Mark Fisher mm-hmm. or whatever, capitalist realism, uh, where most uh, people don't believe large scale change is possible. The right and the, the capital capital are victorious and the left and the labor movement and the working class are extremely demobilized, extremely atomized. So we need to like take that into account. Like if we're going to imagine a massive working class overthrow of capitalism on the scale of what climate requires, like we need to take into account how defeated we are. <laughs> and, right. and so so I would I would say that. Um, in that context of neoliberal defeat of massive victory of capital, um, we have to be a little flexible about some things that, that, that strict Marxists would call reforms or social democracy might be what we have to look for in this context because um, f- fully automated luxury communism is not necessarily a week away, right? It's not coming soon, I would say. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, there, there are still reasons to be skeptical, but I hear that argument. And that argument, I'll tell you what, that argument sounded much more convincing to me in 2017 yeah. than it does now after mm. the defeat of Bernie Sanders, the defeat yeah. of Corbyn, um, the defeat of Melanchon, I think so you say his name in France. <laughs> right. Uh, and um, so we'll have to talk about that a little bit more. But I will give you this. I, I actually... My father was born, was raised in Norris, Tennessee. Do you know what Nor where what Norris, Tennessee is, and why it exists? And not exactly, but I imagine it has some TVA connection. Yes, it was only built to be the place where the engineers for the dam nice. lived. So it's a very nice. odd little community. It was one of the first places, um, or at least it was an early place to have been electrified course yeah uh in that in that area and uh and it and uh it was you know touted as a very innovative high-tech community to live in even though it was this tiny little town yeah. um and also you, if you go there now it's funny to go and listen to the southern accent 
disappear mm-hmm. <laughs> or in this little town in Norris. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, it, it's not entirely gone, but it's like my grandparents didn't have Southern accents. Although my, mm-hmm. my grandfather was a journalism professor and not a, not an engineer, mm-hmm. but, um, but yeah, Norris is this uh, little community that exists because of uh, the new deal and because of the electrification of the United States and because of a massive hydroelectric dam, um, which, you know, it, everyone in that community was very proud of, you know, yeah. 30, 40 years later. So, um, um, so it's not, you're not wrong to say, Hey, the state can intervene and it right. can really massively change the standards of living, the way uh, the way things operate, we can modernize. The state always has been a f- part of the force of modernization yeah. from the beginning. But the problem we have now is that the state, I mean, the reason, I think that we underestimate why neoliberalism came to be. Yeah. Um, neoliberalism started because of the Ford's project mm-hmm. uh, fell apart because the boom that happened after World War II. Right wound down right. and and we just can't i mean i know 2008 was a long time ago but it wasn't that long ago <laughs> and we're still dealing with the repercussions of that economic crisis the covid crisis and Absolutely. the economy it's really unclear what we're going to do now so uh, i guess i want to ask you do you think that something like a green new deal could actually have help us uh, uh come get out from under the capitalist crisis of eco- the economic crisis that's sort of rolling and um, uh, and along with that, do you think that what got us out of the Great Depression back in the day was the New Deal? Well, uh, I mean, I totally agree with your point that um, this idea of kind of like a Green New Deal, social de- democratic solution to climate seemed seem on the on the table in 2017, 2018 in a way that it does not anymore. Um mm-hmm. But I, I think uh, I've written this in another essay in Catalyst where, you know, we got to be honest, like uh, trying to run a socialist for president in the context of a, a massively defeated working class labor movement was not exactly the way you should go about it. <laughs> um, t- and if you look at the New Deal, um, it wasn't that FDR came in and said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to like enact all these working class reforms because I'm really smart and, and, uh, and I want to, I want to help the the masses of people. It was, it was really massive working class upheaval and strikes and organization that, um, that forced these massive changes, you know, typically mm. the biggest strike waves were in 1934 and then lo and behold, 1935 are kind of like the major things we associate with the new deal, like the national labor relations act, social mm. security act, all this stuff. And uh, I would say that history is really unpredictable and things can change very quickly. Because I think if you went and talked to a lot of the Marxist, there were Trotskyist and other communist labor organizers chipping away at, at, you know, organizing workplaces in the 1920s. If you would have asked them in 1929 if they thought there was going to be a massive um, labor upsurge and... uh, uh, strike wave that took hold of the entire country and then pushed through this sort of massive reformist. I don't think they would have thought that was conceivable. Um, so, I mean, I won't, but I, I, I won't don't know. That, right. I do yeah, know that, that, know that was a time like before then. And, and around that time we had a real socialist party in the country exactly. rather than just a democratic party. There were socialists of America. I think Eugene Debs is from around that period of time you know a little yep. earlier early um yeah. um and uh and there was a, a a kind of socialism in america that competed with populism and around that era that went away yes after the new deal that that in a way that was defeated by yeah the new deal um no absolutely but, so i you know i don't know what the prospects for that kind of socialism were or what it would have happened or if we would have, if Eugene Debs had won, would we have turned into Soviet Union? I don't, you know, I don't know. <laughs> like the, well, um, I mean, but, the more effective uh, organizers in the thirties were the communist party and they were very much linked almost no, right, I mean, right, linked right. to the Soviet Union. And, and uh, they were trying to, to, to create revolutionary change. 
And you're, you're absolutely right. Like the way in which uh, FDR and the Democrats kind of neutralized those radical socialist currents mm -hmm. by all these reforms is really significant. Um, and I think we need to learn those lessons. Like um, essentially, as much as the New Deal did all these great things, it didn't challenge um, it didn't challenge capital's control over investment in ways that uh, or over production more more bluntly mm -hmm. in ways that would really lead to significant uh, transformations in the relations of production. And so, as you said, like when you leave those power relations intact over production, it might work for a, a, a period of a post-war boom, but once uh, the profit rate starts to fall and you see crisis, that capital is going to get organized and take back what they think is theirs. And, and uh, that's what exactly what happens. So I think we learned a lot about um, the, the problems with social democracy, the, the limits of that kind of reformist program. Um, but again, like, uh, I think if we, I do think if like, if we think we can only solve climate change through a massive ab revolution, abolition of capitalism, like <laughs> yeah, I think right. we're gonna we're gonna be it's gonna be hard hard uh, a heavy lift as they say to actually we can't even uh, only get to communism or socialism through the abolition of capitalism. Like we have to take steps and organize politically and have demands that make sense in this context to get there. I'm not totally. denying that, but I'm just, you know, like how, what that means. I'm not sure. That's one of the things I'm sort of, this whole sublation project is about is like, okay, we suffered a defeat. Right. Why don't we think it again th from the beginning? Like just what is reformism about from the historical context? Why are we, you know, what was a social democratic uh, movement originally? What is it now? That kind of thing. Um, but what I want to ask you in the current moment is like, what did you think of uh, in the last year or so the uh, great resignation? I think it was called mm -hmm. it's this, this the refusal to go back to work. And then mm -hmm. that was followed up by uh, at first a failure to unionize the Amazon, uh, yes. some Amazon warehouses. And then uh, now Chris Smalls, mm -hmm. I don't know what how much is just him, but. I know him, so I mean, I've interviewed him a couple times, so I feel like it's just him, and he did. <laughs> <laughs> he he went in and, and got that Staten Island warehouse uh, organized and and unionized. So there is a, and I'm sure there's also other areas that, that where there's moments of hope, and it does seem like there's been a lot of activity. Yeah, during a period of time that's like without the without the squad, not because of the squad, not because of Sanders, but yes, because of the moment um yeah. is that hope do you find that hopeful and what do you think people who are on the left and want to make some structural massive changes to get us out from under a lot of different crises ought to do yeah so um i think many of us when when the bernie thing fell apart in 2020 like the sort of knee-jerk thing was that the only option we have now is the option we've always had which is building the power of the labor movement and, and the power of workers in, in actual workplaces and organizing unions and stuff. And um, so to see that actually happen um, in an Amazon warehouse, and by the way, like a extremely strategic Amazon warehouse, like this is the, the hub of the whole New York City metropolitan area. And the capacity now that these workers have to shut down that particular facility is pretty amazing. Um, and it's real power. And, uh, and I would... I would I would really gently correct that it really wasn't only Chris Smalls. Oh, fine. Uh, <laughs> like you, you read the, the the accounts of what happened, and it was a really literally the there were there are members of communist sects <laughs> that were in that warehouse, and they were handing out pamphlets from communist organizers in the steel industry from the 1930s. Um, I believe it was called the Trade Union Unity. League. Uh, I might have got that trade union educational league or something. This this sort of rank and file uh, strategy that communist organizers had in the twenties and thirties. These organizers in Amazon were handing out these pamphlets to to try to just go back to basics about how to organize a workplace. And it's kind of interesting because there's an Amazon warehouse is not all that different from a steel plant. You know, it's a massive concentrated factory like. Uh, uh, mm -hmm piece of infrastructure and uh and and it was just nitty gritty labor organizing work that made that happen they were 
in the, you know, people would have a day off, the organizers, and they wouldn't take their day off. They'd come to the plant uh, or the warehouse and they'd go into the break room and, and talk with their colleagues about voting for a union. And it was just, they were phone banking, they were having these conversations and somehow, some way they actually won enough people over to vote yes. And, um, but, uh, I know that if Chris Smalls was here, like on the line, and I said it was just Chris Smalls, he would be the first one to tell me, no, man, that's wrong. That, you know, <laughs> there were so many people who did so many things, yeah. and he wouldn't want to take credit for it. But yeah. uh, I vicariously want to get credit for knowing him, so I'm going to say it's all him. Um, well, but no, I mean, it's they exciting. Need, they need leaders, and he is mm -hmm. clearly like uh, what Jane McAlevey would call like an organic workplace leader. Mm -hmm. and. Clearly, he was crucial, right? Like, I don't want to downplay yeah. Chris Small right. is like the greatest, but but mm -hmm. it, like you can't do it alone. And he had a huge organizing team. Uh, you know, it was really fascinating. Let's go talk, bring it back to your the environmental movement and the subject of your book. Um, yes. When you see something like the organizing of Amazon, and um, uh, it's it does seem like it's hopeful. It doesn't immediately strike any most people. I, I don't think as hopeful in terms of climate change. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think the 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 point of your book uh, is that it is mm -hmm. that work workers' power uh, will be helpful um, yeah. when it comes to fighting climate change. Yeah. Um, and so I want, if you can, like, can you can you map that out again for people who are watching? Like, how is it that uh, other than just uh, helping to get the Green New Deal in, yeah. what will the labor movement growing yeah. do yeah. to help the fight climate change? So it's, uh, um, I mean, sort of the, the core argument I would want to make is that, um, you know, the problem, like I said before, like the climate crisis, solving it requires confronting capital and if we're going to confront capital, um, there's not historically we don't have a lot of examples of of massive uh, forces that have been able to confront the power of capital other than working class uh, power and not not just in strikes and unions, but also in political parties and um, mass institutions. So uh, that just seems like you know, a, a good historical reference point to if you want to build power over capital. We've been living through five decades of not building power against capital, but um, but I would say in the in the more kind of I mean, there's the Green New Deal could be like seen as some sort of like um, attempt at kind of doing a kind of program uh, that political parties used to do that like. Um, this is the kind of working class program for a climate policy, but we don't have, a, as you mentioned earlier, we don't have a working class party, labor party in the United States, and there would be tremendous work to get that going. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, like I said before, like in order to rebuild the left, it really has to start with labor organizing and union organizing with like the kind we did see at Amazon or Starbucks or whatever. Um, and the argument I make in the book is that basically anyone that thinks about labor organizing um, thinks about it strategically in terms of their particular strategic sectors. In the 1930s, those organizers really said, we're going to focus on steel, automobiles. We're going to focus on these kind of strategic sectors. Nowadays, uh, a lot of labor activists say, like, actually, the strategic sectors are education and healthcare and possibly logistics, which Amazon would fit into. And you saw the teacher strikes and the kind of strategic power those strikes could bring to bear in terms of forcing rapid policy changes. Um, what I argue in the book is that uh, essentially climate crisis really, as we were talking about earlier, to be solved, it goes through the electricity sector. And um, lo and behold, the electric utility sector, at least in the United States, probably most places around the world is one of the most unionized, one of the most, one of the last places in the economy in the U.S. that actually has a significant level of union density. Um, so that we already have these existing institutions of power on the left and then the labor mm -hmm. movement in the electric sector. And so uh, we should think about organizing with those unions in those unions 
You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of tradition on the left of so-called rank and file strategy of actually of militant socialist activists trying to get jobs in particular unions that are strategic for building a mass movement. And um, uh, while like DSA has been all about, um, they have a pamphlet, like why you should become a teacher and join a union. Um, what I sort of humbly propose is that we should start to see those electric unions and other kind of building trade unions that are going to be the workers that build a new energy system that have the knowledge, skills, an understanding of the energy system, like those, those are the, those are the unions we have to win over. And unfortunately, in a lot of the climate left, um, you just because it's so professionalized, it's all in NGOs, it's all in academia. Most people just have this general sense, like, yeah, those unions are problematic, and we're not going to really engage with them because some of them like Trump, some of them are racist, some of them are. Pro you know, so you get when you bring this up amongst climate activists, they get really uncomfortable because they just they think these unions are just hopeless. Right. They're bad. They're they're bad, problematic people. <laughs> and and we just can't strategically. We can't just ignore these unions. They're right in the belly of the beast. We need to transform. So we have to have a strategy that really listens to what they're saying, really takes uh, the their members concerns. And also, I mean, we do have to acknowledge they are, they have become conservative and and probably very top down, sort of sort of like what Ken Moody would call business unionists, like totally aligned with the boss. And mm -hmm. so, like, we do need to organize in them to try to make them more radical and and so forth. But but we can't just ignore them. They they need to be a huge vehicle of of organizing for the climate movement, and they're just not right now. So, um, uh, the one argument I make is that. Actually, these unions should recognize that their members and their status as unions are under threat by right now a, a, a sort of capital led green energy transition. Because if you look at the renewable energy industry right now, it's ex it's almost it's exclusively private capital that that um, drives renewable energy investment. And some of the it's insane. I could go on and on about this stuff about um uh, tax credit policy and how the richest people in the economy kind of take advantage of renewable energy tax credits. But the other thing about it is a, a lot of this investment in renewable energy development, it's extremely anti-union. It's extremely uh, non-union. It relies on much more insecure, precarious, transient workforces. And so mm -hmm. if the if the existing electric unions aren't, aren't strategic and careful, they're going to be swept away by this kind of green anti-union capitalism, and they're mm -hmm. going to lose their their they're already losing in a lot of ways. You know, you see you know, climate activists would cheer this, but you see coal plants closing down. You see uh, natural gas plants uh, that can close down. And, mm -hmm. and those have good union jobs and union members are really devastated and communities are really devastated when those close. But if we just allow the market and capital to take to, to, to lead this transition, those unions are going to be even more screwed. And so that's the pitch I would make that we we actually need to organize these unions so that they can realize that their their status is under threat. They have a kind of existential crisis in this energy transition. They need to kind of think about how to wed a union strategy to a kind of, again, this sort of broader, you can call it Green New Deal, kind of massive public investment strategy, which could actually ensure that this transition is 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 one that includes unions. I um, used to know a guy who was a member of the ISO. This is back mm -hmm. in the early 2000s. And <clears throat> we worked together uh, on a, at a, an arts organization for a while. The Oregon Symphony, I believe is how I met him. And um, he was a cool guy. And we got along really well because he was a, a trot and I was some sort of weird anarchist at the time. And we were friends and we got right. drinking. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, but I, I always thought it was very funny because like he quit working, uh, at the arts organization and he joined UPS Yep. and he threw his pillow away. He, th <laughs> he didn't keep a pillow cause he wanted to be like working class. And so, he <laughs> and, uh, to me, this was like, there was something fundamentally wrong and I couldn't imagine him going to work at UPS and really getting along well with the other people who hadn't gone to a really good university and yeah. decided to become socialists. And then you yeah. know, were there because that's where they were. Yeah. Um, and I imagine I said to him, I bet you all of your work, fellow workers are, go home and sleep on pillows. 
Like, you know, come on, what are you doing? <laughs> They're all pro pillow. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> oh, and I just thought, you know, oh, that pillow reference is Trumpist now. And everything's crazy. But oh, any- my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but anyhow, the, uh, the, the my question here is, like, how do you avoid – Ending up like my friend who's part of the I, who's part of the ISO, sending young people out to join uh, to, to become parts of unions and uh, get part involved in industries where they're just going to be isolated and annoying and maybe sleeping without a pillow. I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you know, it's really not for me to say. Is you know, I'm a tenured professor. I'm I have a very comfortable middle class for me to like tell young kids like go get a job with ups or go get a job in an amazon warehouse and good luck to you yeah i mean i totally get some it's not for everyone right um and it's right and if you're going there in order to be to be an organizer yeah maybe that isn't so great i don't know like maybe we got to work like maybe (sighs) we should work on a party that could offer yeah everyday workers something Right. Rather than than go in and say, "Hey, why don't you guys start a party?" I've read some books. You know, you know what I no, mean. No, <laughs> I I totally agree with you that that's the wrong way to go about it. Um, yeah, I think when you read, you know, I'm I'm a fan of the labor notes people and the mm-hmm. and the tradition, and also Jane McAlevey's work, and 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 these people really argue that you should not go in thinking you have all the ideas, right? You, you mm-hmm. actually should go in the, the way they explain it is, you know, identify who are the leaders in this workplace. Like who, who are the people that workers actually respect? You know, I, I, I just heard this and I actually haven't verified it, but um, it was just a tweet I saw. Um, but apparently in the Amazon warehouse, there was um, some guy who was a Trump supporter, but he was a worker there and everyone really respected him. And, and he was a really pro union guy. And Chris Smalls and the organizing team realize if they can get this guy on their team, everyone's going to follow. Because I think he was called like Uncle Frank or something. <laughs> like he was, like like he was yeah. just this really respected, you know. Again, like problematic, maybe racist Trump supporter, but he became a key organizing vehicle. Mm-hmm. So, um, so these workers, yeah. If you if you're going to be the type of not to throw shade on ISO, but if you're going to be some activist that thinks they can come in and be like all right, we're going to read the communist manifesto and Lenin. And now we're going to, you know, like your pillow decision was his own. Like that was not coming from the central committee to get rid of your pillow. (laughs) (laughs) That was just his own thing. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I think you have to be humble. You know, you have to have those organizing conversations where you're not talking, you're listening to what the Mm -hmm. workers are saying. And, uh, and in so far as we can get organizers to do this, who aren't, coming with all the cultural baggage of the PMC that, that I think still divides a lot of, uh, of a lot of DSA activists and um, whoever else from a kind of broader non-college educated working class. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that needs to be really thought about seriously. Um, And again, um, the one other thing I wanted to mention is that I think there's a lot of discussion about, Oh, those, those, I think they were called the international socialist in the seventies. And they, they did this thing where they all got jobs in the steel industry, right. And they Mm -hmm. did, or they, they got these union jobs and they were going to create the revolution through the labor movement, through the unions. And it really didn't go well. And a lot of people's lives and careers were, uh, you know, not, were, were negatively impacted, but I think sometimes we don't think about they tried to do this in the 70s <laughs> and like Reagan came and neoliberalism came and, the you know, there's all these historical massive shifts of power happened. And so, yeah, it didn't work in that context. That was not a great time to try to rebuild the labor movement. It was when the labor movement was being crushed. So right. in the 2020s, uh, things look different. I'm not saying the labor movement's going to rise again and we're going to see the but I think the conditions are different and there's more historical possibilities of a resurgence of a labor movement. So that maybe this strategy might make a little more sense now than it did in the 1970s with the caveat that again, I don't feel like I should be telling young people to choose their career based on socialist strategy that it's not for everyone. And, but if some people want to kind of fuse 
you know, this PMC idea of like, what am I going to do with my life? What's my career with an actual, just like, I want to get a union job and organize my workplace. Like if people are interested in that, they should think about doing it. I would say. Yeah. Listen, I want you to hold on. We've been, we've talked about 47 minutes. Yep. Um, I'm going to end the recording, but don't go anywhere. If you enjoy these videos, you should click on the subscribe button and click that bell. You should also consider supporting me on Patreon. Patrons get access to a second behind the scenes parrot room discussion where we dish out gossip or go into the weeds on topics such as the tendency of the rate of profit to decline, imperialism, and the critical theories of Tiffany Percet and Donald Most. You'll also get access to both the public and private version of the revised Pop the Left series with Ashley Frawley and Pascal Robert, and the new Zoomer Philosophy series. Your support will not only make content like this possible, it will also help to establish a new publishing venture through Diet Soap Media. Right now, supporting me on Patreon will make a big difference.